the Friday Five, of course. Admiral. Good morning, Rob. Great to be here. Sergeant Michael Heights. Good morning. Great to be here. Longest tenured member of our crew, Mr. Michael Carl. Good morning. Are you still the senior fellow at the Tuscarora Institute? Does yeah. that still go on? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you hadn't talked about the Tuscarora Institute in a long time. It's been a while. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When's your next meeting? Uh, ask me too quick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, you're also the president, vice president, secretary, and all the members? <laughs> no. <laughs> Bill's implying this is a tax write-off. <laughs> we, we have members. Uh, Mr. Lawrence Schultz. Great to be here. Good to have you. Pull your microphone down just about two, three inches there. We're getting some beautiful Excellent. weather. Not as good as they got in Cleveland last night. No, yeah. no, that's really a harbinger of Christmas. If you like snowy football. It's Cleveland. Well, that's, uh, that's it. You, there's a sort of inherent price you pay if you live in Cleveland. So For many reasons. Yes. Via telephone in the Joe Ferretti telephone seat is Mr. David Valente. David, good morning to you. Good morning. Great to have you. Good to have you on. You sure? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> I can hear the excitement. Uh, in yeah, yeah, it's just, it's just <laughs> pouring, pouring through. All right, uh, no intros this morning. We get right to it with Mr. David Valente as the leadoff hitter in the Joe Ferretti seat. David. All right, so uh, we've seen since the election a number of cabinet appointments uh, by the Trump administration, including one dearly departed Matt Gates. Um, uh, replaced by Pam Bondi uh, as AG designate. Uh, it's been a very, uh, at the best, I think you could say it's a mixed bag of, of people nominated, but let's talk about the least qualified nominees for cabinet departments, um, whether it's uh, Alinda McMahon at the Department of Education, um, Christy Noem, who's going to protect us from the from the bad puppies, uh, at Department of Homeland Security, or uh, Pete Pete Hegseth at uh, the Department of Defense, who do you think is the least qualified Trump uh, designee for a cabinet position? Well, there's one less to consider now, so uh, and you have to explain your reasons if you feel that way. Now, if you don't feel, yes. David, if you don't feel as though any of them are unqualified, what do you want them to do in that situation? Uh, Maybe explain why you don't feel they're unqualified. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, silent. honestly, <laughs> you don't think that some of these folks are not qualified for the positions, then you might want to reevaluate your qualifications. But or your name might be Michael Carl, who gets the first chance to go at this one. Michael, go right ahead. <laughs> <clears throat> it's uh, interesting that you would pick me first because I've paid not nearly as much attention to the specifics of these appointments as mm-hmm. as uh, the left-wing media has <clears throat> and i am uh, pleased that gates got out and i think he's been well replaced by the, this woman uh but i you know it, there trump is is sending signals with these appointees and but he's also saying that he wants to you know get get moving fast and to fix the country so i think that's that's positive, but but I, I agree that there's some doubts about a number of them. But I, I'm a, I can't get specific. I only go to Larry Schultz then because I know he can. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, this ties into uh, one or more of the topics that I proposed as well. Um, it is good that Matt Gates is gone. I think uh, everyone here will probably <laughs> acknowledge that he was. Uh, not fit to be Attorney General of the United States. It's almost a laughable thing to say. Um, I I think that Mr. Hegseth uh, at the Department of uh, Defense is in some real trouble now. Um, As it turns out, he um, had an incident that was investigated where a woman accused him of sexual assault, and he was not uh, charged or found guilty, but uh, he was um, uh, pretty closely investigated, and his explanation was that it was consensual. So it was consensual cheating on his spouse, and consensual for that woman to cheat on her spouse as well. That was his uh, idea of this. 
I, I really think in the Department of Defense, especially as we have uh, moved women uh, into the Department of Defense and um, become more of a mixed uh, group, that that's not a very good scene for, or a very good sign, I should say, uh, for the future of the U.S. military. The, the other thing is, the guy has no apparent qualifications for this job. He was a, a major in the Naval Reserves. Um, he was not a regular Navy uh, guy. Now, we've had other people, Donald Rumsfeld, who started two wars while he was uh, with George Bush in the, in the Bush White House, was also a Naval, Naval Reserve officer. I, I think people in the military would like to see somebody who's in the active duty military along with them, or has been, uh, so that they would have an understanding of what the struggles are and what the difficulties are. So uh, Hegseth is the, the next one up, and he... I know more about him simply, simply because there's been more talk and he does not seem qualified to me. To Mr. Height now, and uh, a couple of questions are posed, one from Mr. Valente and a statement by Mr. Schultz, which was that uh, people in the military would prefer that someone who was active in the military was leading them. You were in the military, as was Mr. Carl and Mr. Stubblefield. Your thoughts? Well, to, to that degree, um, I would say... Even though he was in the reserves, he he was active for quite a bit of his career, and he did see uh, combat in in Iraq and Afghanistan. So um, I, I think he is more than qualified. Um, I, I know some people have an issue with that, but I certainly don't. I wouldn't consider him um, the the worst pick or the the least experienced pick. Um, I thought that was Matt Gates, um, obviously, until he he. D decided to retire who other than being a lawyer i don't know that he practiced much more than a couple of years before he went into politics and um has been a politician ever since um so i don't i'm not sure what qualified him uh to be the ag so i thought that was the weakest of the picks uh, but I also thought that was a political pick. I thought that was a political move to get him out of Congress. Uh, I don't think he was ever going to get through the confirmation process, and he was never going to be AG. So uh, that's why I think that may have been more political than than a strategical uh, pick that, that was actually going to be AG. Pam Bondi, I think, is a, a great pick um, to, to succeed uh, him, and I, I, I don't think there will be any – uh, problem getting her confirmed. Um, uh, with respect to uh, the the extramarital affairs and and so on and so forth with with any of these picks, um, I used to think as a younger man that that was important in politics, but the left beat it into my head during the Clinton years <laughs> that that just didn't matter in politics. And you're still and talking now, about Bill Clinton. Right, I knew this was coming. Exactly, because you beat it into my head that it didn't matter. You you talk about the, the leader of the military. How about the leader of the free world? It didn't matter, the extramarital affairs. So, so don't preach to me now about how... This man well, is not fit to, to hold that position. Speaking of preaching, remember, my party was never the party of family values as the Republicans advertise themselves to be. Um, so, uh, you know, nobody beat it into your head. You said, well... This is just so offensive to my family values. No, you, and now those family your values party have come been and told abandoned. Me how you are the the party of the middle class, and then you parade these these elites out to to tell me how I should vote for the Democratic candidate. So hmm. don't tell me how you're for the middle class either. <laughs> we don't have much the of a middle class back. anymore. All right, Mr. Stubblefield. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're asking about the least qualified. I think uh, Rubio is very well qualified. I'll take him off the table. I think he's very well qualified. My question is, or my answer is, I don't know what qualification we're looking for. 
I do not believe we're looking for the traditional qualifications, and that's what we're kind of talking about now. Uh, Trump has advertised, he campaigned, and he's saying now he has a mandate to disrupt government to disrupt the agencies, and to remake the agencies. A traditional, can, a traditional leader is not the one to disrupt. That's the, and a traditional leader is not the one that, that, is, that people will look for to go in and actually tear down and build back up or remodify, whatever the case may be. So my question is, I don't really know what we're looking for in a, uh, uh, in a, leader for these certainly if we're looking for the traditional leader none of these i think pass muster but if we're looking for a disruptor someone to tear down and build back up again they very well may be the right ones i think the primary qualification is there has to be some association at some point along the way in your life with the job you're being appointed to but i think that's not the primary qualification the primary qualification is loyalty to the president i think uh Donald Trump learned his first time in office that filling these offices with the traditional person who might be qualified to fill this role is not what he can function best with. He needs to function best with people who are going to be loyal to him, period, end of story, 100%. You'll grow into the job if you have to, but it doesn't really matter because I'm going to tell you what to do anyway. And you're going to listen or else you're out. And, And those are the qualifications that you need for these jobs right now. Because he's approaching this in a much different way than a traditional, as you had said, Bill, a traditional president would approach these jobs. It's, but, a, it's, a, it's a different dynamic. But what you're saying and what I'm saying are very consistent. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I agree with you. Yeah, I'm just giving you a little bit further yeah. explanation yeah. here. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Mr. Valente, where are you on this? I, well, you know, here's the thing. and I, I, I know that Trump values loyalty above everything uh, to himself and – the, the worst thing you can do as an executive is surround yourself with yes people because you make, and we know Donald Trump's history with business. Yes, he has had some successes, but he's had a lot of failures. If you don't have dissenting voices within your cabinet, within people advising you on certain items, the the tunnel vision and, you know, the, the ability to, to see threats and the ability to um, to, to, you know, really get things done and, and be, yes, you, you are, uh, if I don't dis- disagree with the idea that Trump is a disruptor and wants to disrupt government. The, the problem is the world doesn't take a moment to allow you to disrupt government. Uh, the, the world is a, is a, it comes at you fast, especially as president. And, um, you need to have dissenting voices. You need to have somebody, you know, at least one person in the room that's going to pump the brakes on, on, on things from time to time and say, hey, have we looked at it from this this angle? Um, because not all disruptions are, are good. Um, it, can the government stand a little bit of disruption? Absolutely. Um, you know, the, the government is not a, absolutely not a perfect thing. Uh, you know, I've advocated for a lot of changes within government. I just don't like the idea of a leader just stacking nothing but yes men and women in in the cabinet to just just go along to you know make Don happy. Um, uh, for me, the the least qualified uh, for for what he's wanting to do would probably be Christy Nome at Department of Homeland Security, um, a governor of a interior state that you know. Uh, really doesn't have a whole lot to do with, uh, you know, didn't have a whole lot of uh, issues with, with domestic, domestic terrorism or anything like that, or, or uh, you know, her her big qualification was shooting a puppy. And I I, I just don't think that she, for what Dom wants to do with, with, you know, when it comes to the border, when it comes to, um, uh, you know, deportations and all that stuff. I just don't think that she is qualified to handle that position. Um, you know, Linda, Mc- you can talk about Linda McMahon being at the Department of Education. I can't wait till you know teachers are allowed to do stone cold stunners on on misbehaving kids. Um, hey, that's just called Catholic school, David. <laughs> you know, from my youth. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then you know, Pete Hexeth. Yeah, I mean. It's not just that that he had the the charges it was a, a massive 
lengthy police report on the incident, um, and then it was settled with with some hush money, kind of you know, along the lines of a Stormy Daniels type deal. So, um, for an organization that values duty, honor, honor, and loyalty, um, to have a person of his repute at the head of it is is concerning, especially with Trump talking about replacing quote-unquote woke generals um is again there's there's a lot of people to pick from but i think christy noam is going to be the probably the worst among them didn't heg seth have broadcaster immunity when that was going on didn't he have that he's working for fox broadcaster yeah isn't there Um, such a thing as broadcaster immunity mike i can do whatever i want while i'm in the job of broadcaster and there's no consequence for it maybe a concept ask your wife I, I don't agree with it. <laughs> but notice, though, I mean, we've gone... You better hope so, right? We, we, <laughs> <laughs> I do have three attorneys on retainer at all times on Fridays. Uh, we've gone from uh, Mitt Romney being disqualified to be a president because he put a sick dog on the roof of his car to someone being appointed to a pretty high office who shot a puppy. We've changed our attitudes toward dogs over the years, Mike. I'm going to tell you that right yes, now. Yes, we have. You know, there's been a full-blown change on that one there, too, right? So, uh, y- your point about yes men, uh, David, I-, I think every president, we all agree, has the right to appoint people. We just kind of assume that they're going to appoint someone who's at least remotely qualified uh, for the position. But the idea of loyalty is an interesting thing because you're taking an oath to the Constitution yes. before the person. Well, the person's not even mentioned. It's the, and you're in a federal... But it is, it, it is in this particular... But he's the constitutionally elected president of the United States. Who also took a constitutional oath, which last time he ignored. So um, that oath ain't going to mean much. He he effectively carried out his duties as president in many, many ways. Far better than his successor. They assaulted the Capitol at his direction. Come on. He was not loyal to the Constitution of the United States. His appointed vice president was, and, and... that's why the Constitution, you know, was preserved and saved. And ex- which, which is the question that comes around, Mike? Too are we are we taking a, a oath of loyalty to the president or to the Constitution with these appointments? He is. You're taking an oath of loyalty to the person who is elected under the constitutional system to be president of the United States. Mm-hmm. The, this distinction that you're trying to make, uh, I don't agree with. It, so, it, it's a, I mean, well, what if Mike Pence had made a different decision to be loyal to the man as opposed to the Constitution? Because Mike Pence specifically cited the Constitution on January. Well, then that would be unconstitutional. I agree. I agree. I, I mean, that that effort to, uh, you know, I mean, Trump didn't tell him to stop. He he t- he 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 argued about the problems with you know the election process, and and then these people reacted, and many of them have been you know uh, ch- not just charged but convicted of crimes, uh, and and served time. Uh, whether the many of them get uh, ex- you know exonerated later is you know mm-hmm. will probably happen, uh, but but. But the system worked. It worked then, ultimately, and it worked this time. To, to answer your question, mm-hmm. they, take, they take an oath to the Constitution. Just like everybody that joins the military, you raise your hand and you take an oath to the Constitution. Your loyalty is not to Trump. It is to the Constitution. Now, that doesn't mean that Trump can't pick people that are loyal to him and loyal to the Constitution. And, and this premise that nobody is going to push back on his ideas or suggestions, I think, is a, a false premise. That I do think that even though they're loyal to Trump, they are going to push back. They're going to have their own ideas. They are going to say, no, Mr. President, I think this is a better, better way forward. In the end, he is the president, and he gets to make the final decision. That doesn't mean these people push back. I think what he had before were people that pushed back, and then when he made the final decision, disagreed with the final decision and tried to undermine him. 
And and that's what he's trying to avoid at this point. You can't once the president makes the decision, you can't go around undermining his decision. You have to abide by it, say, okay, this is this is the way forward, as long as it doesn't violate the Constitution. Um, and and some of that may be debatable, but at, it's very at this point, at this point, well, I don't know that anybody violated the Constitution. Let me well, step in very. Let's under, Go ahead, Dave. Well, let's understand that that hanging over all of this is the recent Supreme Court decision that Trump's acts are once he takes office will be official acts, and you know whether they fly in the face of the Constitution or not, he can be deem them official acts and and direct his cabinet to do whatever he wants them to do. So let's, you know, the the game has changed from, you know, his first term because now they're the, the training wheels are off. The, the governor is off. It, it's, you know, full speed ahead and there's really no restraint. And well, that's, that's yeah. the underlying backdrop bill to everything we're discussing here. Yeah, exactly right. Now, January the 6th, we came down to a fork in the road. One person was at that fork in the road, and the, that person made a decision in favor of the Constitution. That person could have made the decision the other way around and would have had a constitutional crisis. I think what we're going to be seeing, uh, not so much of the, depart, uh, the, ele- the cabinet members, is what the Senate will do in the next few weeks. Will they go along with the uh, uh, recess appointments that Trump is pushing so hard for? Uh, some of the senators say they will. Others say they, they're not prepared to give up their constitutional rights. That's going to be the first indicator. Do we have en- enough Mike Pence's in the in the room to push back on Trump? If they do not, if they do not stand up, I think it's going to be a lot of Lindsey Graham's that lead in the parade. Larry, yeah, and and the whole idea of Lindsey Graham as a leader is a ridiculous <laughs> idea because every time he disagreed with Donald Trump, you can then pick up a later video clip of him going back to kiss the ring. Uh, so th- that's uh, that's a perfectly good example of the sort of quizzling that Donald Trump wants to run things. Um, and because they will take orders in the end, despite huffing and puffing about how terrible it all is, mm-hmm. In the end, they'll be fine with it. Um, there's a certain number of those in the Republican Senate, and they w- they can be counted upon to vote for these nominees. What we hope for is a few, as as uh, as Bill says, a few Mike Pence's who will say, "Hey, hold on a minute." Remember, on January sixth, Mike Mike Pence did the right thing, but that was only because the hang Mike Pence policy didn't get carried out. Remember, that that crowd of Trump supporters was out in the yard of the Capitol saying, hang Mike Pence. And if they could have gotten their hands on him, Trump would have had to pick a new vice president. I, I don't think that's why he did the right thing. The man has integrity, and I, he went with the I didn't say it's why he did it, but we were lucky. Okay, we were lucky. But, <laughs> but Mike Pence did the right thing because that was the right thing to do. Right. He would not have done the right thing had he been hanged by the neck until dead by that angry crowd. And Donald Trump never once said, "Cut it out, quit chasing hump, uh, 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 quit chasing Pence through the halls of Congress, so he has to run to a car." And and for, remember this when we talk about the, all this loyalty stuff. When Pence got outside, there was a Secret Service detail waiting for him that wanted to get him in the car and take him elsewhere to safety. And he said, "I'm not." getting in that car because he knew that the guy that's now going to be president again was going to arrange for it for him to be in only maryland when he needed to confirm the votes um you know that was lucky mike we were lucky to have mike pence there at the time he did the right thing but that wasn't because donald trump wanted him to so now you're saying the abc agencies are corrupt and on that note this is talk radio wrnr martinsburg and tv 10 phone david valente he is in the ferretti seat david welcome back good morning fuzzy robe is on 
Nice. <laughs> the nice thing about Valente is he doesn't mute himself. He allows me to be the only one who mutes. Ferretti mutes himself a lot. There's a lot of times like, Joe, welcome back. Joe? Joe? <laughs> New law on the show. No more self-muting. Only I have the power to mute. Unless you're Mike Height. Well, I'm not going to self-mute. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to hear what I have to say, Bill. <laughs> Whether you like it or not. <laughs> Mike Carl in the house as well as Larry Schultz. And uh, with issue number two, here is the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Yeah, Rob, I'm going to stay local. Uh, this past week, we've discussed two, two or three different times the uh, uh, school building authority, the amount of money that has been given, the amount of money that's needed and the like. Uh, and I thought, thought that Jackie Long, Melissa Powers, and uh, Dr. Sachs all did a very nice job of explaining the process. And I, I learned a great deal there. Uh, so in summary, uh, last year we got $25 million dollars Berkeley County did from the school building authority. This year we requested four million dollars. Uh, last year the uh, uh, the SBA had probably only about twenty five million dollars to dispense, but because of the clawback, they had around fifty million dollars to dispense. But Last year and this year, there are approximately $250, $275 million requests that have been made. We stay local. We look at what's happening to our schools, uh, as has been described by the, uh, uh, the school board and also the superintendent. Uh, we still have a lot of students in portable uh, classrooms. Uh, these these pose a lot of problems, a lot of different problems. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, question number one, I don't want to look backward. I want to look forward. Uh, and before I give them a question, another another point of clarification, both uh, the school board and Dr. Sachs said that they were, the $4 million was consistent with the, the terms of the bond, uh, which is a three-year uh, three-year duration. Uh, so my question is, uh, looking ahead to next year, as uh, should they be restricted to a, a modest request, or should they go with a more robust request to meet all of our needs? And the second thing is, are the legislators letting down our school system by having an inadequate amount of money into the school building authority. My yeah. question. If only we could find a legislator. Oh, here is one. We Ouch. One. Yeah. Man. I, <laughs> you see, you've been set up. <laughs> Mike, pull that knife out of my back, would you? Man. Delegate Michael underfund the SBA yeah. height, as he's known well, around here. Um, you know, when the SBA asks for money, we, we fund it. I mean, last year we, we gave them even more money. We, we funded everything that was on the books throughout the entire state. We took care of. We said, you need an extra $25, $50 million, boom, here it is, to fund everything to get it off the books. I, I think part of the problem isn't necessarily is the legislature funding enough, but maybe how the SBA decides how they're going to distribute the funding. It's nice if, if Pocahontas County School needs or or wants a new science wing on their school that has 300 kids in it that's nice but when you look at the growth in berkeley county and the eastern panhandle it's not about an additional wing it's not about lights on the football field it's not about any of those things it is about getting children out of pods and into interior classrooms not only is that the way they should be educated but it, that is also a safety issue and we have had kids in berkeley county uh, and, and possibly jefferson and morgan in pods for over 20 years and and it's just not acceptable i i, I don't want to throw stones at the board of education I, I think they're probably doing the best that they can i just think sometimes we look at um our problem now instead of our problem 10 years from now and we're building to correct for now instead of 10 years from now and I, I think if if that's the mentality and I don't know that it is but if that's the mentality then you're always going to have pods you'll never be able to get rid of them because we're always behind 
instead of ahead. And and if you could go to the SBA and say, listen, you know, you you have to do more for growth counties. Um, that's where your student population is. Um, and, and I don't I don't know how much authority the legislature has to direct that. Um, and maybe it's the Department of Ed. Uh, but that's that I believe that's what needs to happen. They need to refocus on how they distribute the money, not necessarily on whether they have enough or not, because, you know, the, the legislature, I think, um, provides them with what they ask for. So there's a major disconnect then when they say two hundred seventy five million dollars needed. And you're saying the legislators gave them everything they needed last year. They required. Well, how much how much of that is paid for by the state and how much of it is paid for locally? It's not the state doesn't come in and provide you with every dollar you need. You, there has to be some local buy in as well. So I think that's one of the reasons the SBA says you have to have projects that are ready to go and you have to have the funding on your side. So if it's a dollar for dollar match and, and Berkeley County needs $10 million, then the SBA needs to fund five and, and Berkeley County needs to, to fund five. But you have to have the five before you can ask for five. That I think that may be sort of the problem, which is why we, we have bonds that we put out and say, you know, we, we need more building in Berkeley County and, and we need the people of Berkeley County to pay for it. Uh, one more question. I'm, I'm, I know we don't do point counterpoint, but you raised an interesting point. Dr. Sachs said approximately uh, only 30 or 40 percent of the counties actually have a bond. Uh, so what you've just said would imply those counties would not be eligible for SBA funding. Well, I don't know. So I don't know enough about yeah. the SBA funding to know whether yeah. there or not they're eligible and what factors goes into to SBA funding. Uh, it's sort of like school aid. I mean, it, it's so convoluted. Who, who really understands it? So uh, I don't know. And I'm not sure who the SBA actually answers to. Is it to directly to the governor, directly to the legislature, or directly to the Department of Ed? So uh, I, I can't answer that as well. Thanks, Mike. Mr. Schultz? Yeah, I mean, um, it it's, goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway. Children are the future of this state. And even though a lot of them, once they get educated, leave for more vibrant economies, uh, are across the country. Um, we have a duty, uh, a pretty important duty, to educate those kids in the best means possible. And that doesn't mean in a trailer behind the high school. Uh, that means in the high school. And so as we now have completely uh, complete uh, Republican control of the branches of the state government, this is a problem going forward um, that must be addressed by Republican politicians as Mike just addressed it. And we need to think about, uh, as a state, um, how do we get ahead of this problem where the maybe the local county can't put together the money, um, uh, put together the money to do its match, and therefore they're not eligible for state funding, and therefore uh, we buy another uh, generation of cheap trailers and put them behind the <laughs> put them behind the school. Um, I, I don't know how that gets uh, resolved. I know in some states, uh, Pennsylvania, for example, the part of PA where I'm from, they're consolidating high schools. And I'm not suggesting this idea. Uh, the high school that I went to is now a kindergarten through 12 school, and there are kids coming from as far as 30 miles away on a bus. Uh, this is a problem that I'm sure